Welcome everybody to the 2018 Baton Rouge Blues Festival. I am Clay Ashe. I'm a DJ at WHYR 96.9 Baton Rouge Community Radio. And I have the distinct honor and privilege today to be interviewing Chris Thomas King. Thank you so much for being here with me, man. Um, normally in these interviews, I do like to start at the beginning and just sort of do a chronological telling, but I came across a, 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 a quote that if you don't mind me quoting you back to you, I'd like to start with this, all right? So this, this was maybe the most interest, interesting thing, I've, a big, big, big statement. One of the most interesting things I've ever heard said about the blues. Somebody asked you, what is blues? Music not meant for polite society. Music that was subversive, risque, dissonant, bawdy, and conspicuously secular. Blues with this... Blues was the soundtrack to social progress and tolerance. It changed, it, sorry, it challenged the tyranny of the church, and because of this, it was demonized. Quote, Chris Thomas King. Let's talk about that for a minute. So can you bring us to the, you have an interesting point of view on the origins of blues, and let's talk a little bit about blues as social consciousness. So you just... Dive right into the deep end here. Sorry, buddy. That was awesome. <laughs> That's a great quote. <laughs> uh, you want me to expound on that? As well? Yeah, if we could unpack that. Uh, okay. Well, I guess a good place to start is, uh, uh, you know, there's, I have a, a philosophy of blues that's probably unique. Yes. But I don't think the philosophy that I have is, is uh, different from its origin. And I think that we've just lost the original um, idea behind the music and why the music came into being I agree. in the first place. Let's go back to the origin then. But before I do that, uh, I think most people think of the blues as, when they think, when you talk about the blues, they think that it's, so we, I just to make some, some some quick definitions, yeah. and then we we'll know we when we say blues we're in, in certain terms, we'll we'll have a, a guiding thing. So let me start with some 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 misnomers and some things that people may not understand. There's a popular notion that the blues began in rural Mississippi or in sharecropping and that it has something to do with slavery and work songs and things like that. And all of that is false. None of that happened. It has no bearing on the origins of the blues. It, 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 it doesn't come from Mississippi. It's not agrarian. It doesn't come from, it, it comes from cosmopolitan and goes to the, to the rural areas. And for you, that is very specifically New Orleans. Well, it, it took a long time before it made its way to, Oak, to, the, to the Okies mm -hmm. and to the Mississippi Delta and to the Carolinas and places like that. Right. It's cosmopolitan. Right. So that's one thing that, that people miss, miss. And then the other thing, the whole word blues, you know, we speak the, the, the King's English, but in Louisiana, they spoke French or Creole. So... The word blues in the Creole culture is a totally different meaning from the Anglo word. And so in old French, you know, there's a word called soccer blue. And most people know what that means. But then in Creole, you kind of have African and French and English all kind of mixed together. And so they make, they shorten words or give words another little Thing. So the word blues is kind of short for soccer blue in a way. And so it means something totally different in Louisiana, in old Louisiana, than, uh, in, in other words, the, king, the, the, the English definition is sad, depressed, melancholy, down in the dumps, and all these kind of things. has nothing to do with the origins of the blues. Right. And uh, the French or Creole meaning of it, you know, has everything to do with blasphemy, something that's salacious. There were laws called blue laws and things, you know, to try to stop people from, from expressing themselves in this way. 
And, um, and the other thing that uh, we need to know is this idea of folk music, what that is. Mm -hmm. Folk music uh, and blues at some point got conflated. And that conflation is what screwed us all up as far as trying to get back to the original philosophy. Right. And folk, I'll define that. It's not my definition, it's the definition of the folklores. Uh, folk music is a music that comes from an illiterate people and is passed on uh, orally, mm -hmm. not in written sheet music, not a music conservatory. It's uh, music that is uh, passed on like, you know, grandpa on the, on, the, on the porch passing on a song in Appalachia, you know, and they sing in Barbary Allen or some old Irish folk ditty, right. and that's kind of considered folk music, you know, and that is very rural, and that is very uh, non-commercial, but... But the metropolitan version of the blues that you're talking about would have been distinctly different than that just through the illiteracy. It, it would have been a very literate form of music. Well, when you say, when you start talking about African Americans and illiteracy, you have to put an asterisk there. All right. Because I don't think there were any laws against people in Appalachia reading. Right. They weren't going to be hauled off to jail because they had a book. Right. And if they chose not to read, that they just chose not to read. Right. But, but African Americans in most places, uh, not necessarily in Louisiana, in old Louisiana, but in, in British colonies, you know, Louisiana was Spanish ruled, you know. But in the British colonies, they created laws to make it a, against the law to read and things like that. So to try to say that that's some natural state of being, as illiteracy is some kind of natural state, even if you were literate, you had to pretend you couldn't read. You know, right. you get in, in trouble there. So trying to force African-American culture into that folk definition, it don't really fit. It's a whole different, the Delta and Appalachia it might seem the same because of the poverty sure. and isolation, but you can't conflate those two things. They're to totally two different cultures. Cool. And so those are some basics and we can go on. Right, okay. So when I say so, folk music, you guys know what I'm talking you about. You are absolutely right to define your terms, yeah. right? I dig your take on this so much. I've I'm, done it a few times. I'm nerding out about it with you now, but I, I love yeah. your take on this. So the origin then of the blues for you as a metropolitan, distinctly New Orleans music is a controversial take on it. But anyway, I love it. Are you good? Do you want to move on to talking about you now? We can go. I'm All right. You All need right. I'll follow. Oh, man. Sorry, but I loved starting there. In fact, I feel like your take on the blues helps make you as an artist make sense. I think, I think that you're thinking about it jives very well with the decisions you've made as an artist. Well, we'll start at the beginning. I like to ask people what their earliest musical memories are, what their first effort to take uh, music into their own hands was, but that may be asking a fish, how's the water? You were born into a very musical situation. What were your earliest memories, if you kind of can put a finger on it? Well, yeah, most people know my father, uh, Tabby Thomas, you know, uh, he kind of helped to bring the, I, you know, bring the blues back to Louisiana in a way. Um, and he, you know, um, so very young, I grew up around music instruments in the house. He had a band, they would practice there. So I had access to instruments and things and I had a insatiable curiosity about how these things work, which annoyed my dad most of the time because I was breaking his strings and ah. screwing up his, his <laughs> he'd come home from work and something is broken, he has to go fix it, you right. know. And, uh, but at the same time, a lot of his friends, you know, people like Slim Harpo and, you know, uh, Lonesome Sundown and, and some of these other gentlemen who were generations older than my dad, you know, um, they were people I just knew, you know, just kind of grew up around. So I was immersed in music, but my formal introduction to music came from my uncle, uh, my, my dad's uh, youngest brother, 
Don, Donald, Donald Washington. And uh, he played trumpet and the, uh, and he was very good at it. He played trumpet um, and he had a scholarship to Florida and m but he went to Southern. But then he went out, he was drafted into the army and he went off to Vietnam. And uh, when he came, he bought a little cornet trumpet and a pawn shop over there and brought it back to me. He played in the military band as well. Mm -hmm. And he brought it back and gave me lessons and kind of taught me how to read music. And, you know, we listened to all these great horn players and stuff. And, and he kind of gave me more of a formal introduction to music. So that, those are the right. early Other than noodling, noodling with guitars, which is fun when you're a kid, mm -hmm. but having somebody sit down, teach you music specifically. Yeah, yeah like the staff. Right. Every good boy does fine. The, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you get your music books out, you do your, 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 your scales, your exercises. Yeah. And then you start listening to some of these great jazz records. Well, they call it jazz, but there's no such thing as jazz. But you another, know, another con controversial, yeah. but very specifically you take on it, was yeah, that jazz no, is blues. It's a misnomer. There's right. no such thing as jazz. That's why I can't nobody tell you what jazz is. Is there, is That's no such true. Thing. Nobody. Can. There's no such thing. <laughs> but true. but we were listening to these great horn players, you know Miles Davis, you know yeah, uh, and some a lot of other people because he was in he was a trumpet was player. A, you know, a he Louis was in, Armstrong guy. Uh, Louis was before his time. Right. Okay. But yeah, Louis, he had Louis Armstrong uh, records around sure. the house. Everyone. You know. But yeah, so that that's my. The seeds the seeds are planted there. Yeah. Now as you become a young man and obviously have interest of your own, where did you start expanding outside of the music that was available immediately into your house and what, what were you sort of delving into? Well, like anybody else, I mean, you, you hear the radio, mm -hmm. you're watching you know, television, you see Soul Train and Bandstand or whatever the, the shows was that people watched when I was a very young kid. Right. And, uh, and you know you hear the popular radio stuff, and um, and 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 another big influence on me was my my brother, uh, my older brother. He was a janitor at at LSU, hmm. at the Assembly Center, and by being a janitor there, he uh, would be working at most of the concerts that they would bring in. Uh. And so at at 12 years old, you know, I was in there when George Clinton landed the mothership. Yes. You know, and, uh, and and that was pretty funky. <laughs> and, you know, they had a lot of smoke on stage, but it was just right. as much smoke in the audience, you <laughs> right, know? Right, right, right. And uh, Peter Frampton came there doing Comes Alive. Uh, Frampton Comes yeah. Alive. I saw him twice at the Assembly Center. Get out. Yeah, and uh, I missed Zeppelin when they passed through there. For some reason, I don't know what I was doing. But I, I didn't know that they were any good, you know. But right. any concert they had... You know, he would just tell me there's a concert coming, and I would I would be there. Yeah. And I think I saw. I saw Sticks, Springsteen, uh, anything. It didn't matter what it was. If they were that's playing amazing. some guitars, I was there. You know. So asking like that's crazy though. I mean, asking that's I know it's a really big question for you, but like asking like, all right, great. So you got blues all around. You're swimming in the blues, and then you start expanding out. You it sounds like you expanded out in literally every direction. I mean, you just love music. Well, I, I was introduced to the trumpet, and so I was going to be a horn player. Mm -hmm. And um, but this was the time when the horn the horn was the dominant instrument in blues up until the '60s. Right. And then the guitar became the dominant instrument. Usually, the dominant instrument in a band is the loudest one. So, if you, whatever instrument is, when, it was, when everything was acoustic, the trumpet was the lead instrument. Right. When but, they plugged in. Right. But then, when, when the blues went electric, then all these trumpet players who played the blues prior, they, you know, was pushed to the background. Right. And Miles Davis tried to fight that, you know, but right. he put in a wah-wah pedal and tried to go play his horn through the amplifiers and stuff. But it's like, look, man, it's not, it's not going to work, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know you're giving it a good go, but, he did try you know, everything, right? yeah, you, it's just not going to happen. Oh, you know, man. Bitches Brew was a pretty hip experiment, <laughs> but that was. Right, yeah, it but, was very hip. But, but, that, he, but he, Miles Davis is a blues musician. Right. And he was like, I'm going to compete with Hendrix and I'm going to compete with. With, with Santana, with, he saw I'm gonna himself in I'm going to compete with, these, with, right. with the electric blues, right. but he couldn't. Wow. But wow. Uh, so anyway, around that time, that's after the trumpet, I kind of gravitated to the guitar. And once I gravitated to the guitar, 
then I was into everybody who played a guitar wasn't, I didn't think in genres of music. That's what it sounds like, yeah. Yeah. So. I, that had to be beaten into me later. <laughs> <laughs> By these corporations, they beat right. that into me. Journalists yeah. are real yeah. bad about that too. Yeah, I hear you. you. I stay, hear stay, stay in your box. No, no, I, <laughs> man, I, I, I really do dig your, your genreless approach. Uh, all right, so we're gonna. They were, they were all playing the blues. We're about to put you in a box, okay? I mean, somebody gonna tell me that Liz Zeppelin isn't a blues band? I mean, no, they stole, they stole more blues than anybody. Yeah. And not very gracefully sometimes. Yeah, so these marketing terms, you know, they're right. just, um, they throw the audience off track. But I think, uh, you know, if you're an artist, um, you know, you have to, you should be more grounded. I mean, you got to play the game, I guess, if you're out there in the no, commercial no. world. Right. But as an, as an artist, you know, as a musician, you as love. a blues musician especially, and one from Louisiana, you know, you should know your music when you hear it, no matter who's doing what, you know. Right. So the next thing that happens to you is sort of the box problem, right? Which is, can you sort of describe to me the d being discovered by the Smithsonian Institute? Yeah. I mean, that, that moment must have been a bizarre, awesome, scary, weird moment. I mean, I, let me not put words in your mouth. You tell me what it was like. Well, uh, I was discovered, quote unquote, by um, Nick Spitzer, who, He's he has he's he's on radio now. I think he does NPR uh, uh, NPR show. I, I don't have the name at the top of my head, but uh, around 1979, he was working at the Smithsonian in D.C. and he was uh, making a transition to be Louisiana's first first folklorist. So um, he took an interest in me. I was a teenager, but I was doing. I had by that time I had made up my mind that I was gonna you know, play blues guitar and kind of do something with it. And he would come to my dad's club and befriended my dad and he would hear me play and he heard my first recordings. And uh, he said he wanted to help me to, you know, introduce me to some people, so to speak. So long story short, he um, wrote a letter to Arhuli Records in Berkeley, California, around 80, early 80s. And, uh, and they, ended up releasing my first album in 1986. And I titled the album, It's a Cold Ass World, but they thought that was a little harsh. <laughs> and Chris Drakowicz uh, changed the name to the beginning, which was a, probably a more appropriate title. But um, yeah, so, so Nick Spitzer was, you know, Folklorist was instrumental in, in me making my first record. And that's a big difference in a person who's like on Star Search or, you know, get signed to a major record label, you right. know, and, and the idea is to sell millions of records and make millions of dollars for the, for the company. But when you're signed to a folk label, there's a whole nother thing that's going on there. You know, it's like you're like some kind of artifact. Right. You know, you're like a, I don't even know, I don't think I have words to describe it, but it's not about selling records. It's about selling few records. To uh, a very specific group to, of people. To aficionados right. who are experts on, or cultural brokers, you know, when it comes to this thing or whatever. And, you know, it's like... You have referred to them as the blues mafia. The blues mafia. <laughs> and the more rare, you know, and authentic, quote unquote, it is, right. then the more value, you know, it has in that, in that marketplace. You know, kind of like paintings, you know. People don't make, you know... It's, you, you you want that one painting, you know, right. that's hanging in your gallery or something that's very valuable. Right. So, I mean, they're dealing in something totally different from, if it's sold millions of records, if it's on popular radio, they have no interest in it. <laughs> right, and you would have been a failure. So, <laughs> right. In their eyes, how bizarre is that? <laughs> yeah, and so, so that was the dichotomy that I was, uh, you know, but I didn't understand that culture, like I said earlier, folk music, I didn't understand what that was. I didn't understand what they meant by that, but I was labeled folk. So when I began to use drum machines and sampling and hip hop and things that, that, that came along during my generation and try to incorporate into my sound, then I was banned from festivals. You know, I was 
long story short, I ended up having to leave the country to continue um, doing my music. But I would say that, you know, this is not this is not much different from what Bob Dylan went through in the '60s with this with these same kind of purists. Going electric, you mean? When he played electric at the Newport Festival. Right. And everybody thought the world was ending, you know, because <laughs> he went commercial or whatever they considered that to be. You know, that he had, he was, uh, you know, some kind of traitor or a, a charlatan. And, um, and it caused all this friction. Well, when I began doing sampling and hip hop and doing that with blues, it had the same kind of reaction. Right. Now, let's not speed past that, though, because I think that that's one of the while it may have been a tough moment for your career. Uh, Can I take this off? Absolutely, if you're more comfortable, please. Yeah. yeah, I'm listening. So while it may have been a very tough moment for your career, I would like you to talk a little bit about that, though, because it, it, I hope now we can look at it as a sort of pioneering move, right? So we're going to bring R&B and funk and hip-hop into the blues and like why what what was that motivation what i mean we know what happened but what was the process going into that like um can you expound upon that at all i know i'm at, <laughs> asking an artist to like explain the artistic well, process is a nightmare but i mean i could but i mean it's it's kind of boring oh, you know to be honest with you man. i don't want to bore everybody all right but uh, I'll just say that that was when I did my first hip hop blues album uh, in the early 90s, where it took a couple of years to get it out, but I was with Warner Brothers Records at the time and had this huge contract with them. And um, I was on the same label as Ice T was on, Ice T and Body Count. Right. And so they came out with their album a few months before mine was scheduled to be released. And uh, it caused a lot of controversy, the cop killer thing. And so. Um, Warner didn't want to release my album. They wanted me to go back and make a new album, and more more traditional. They were pushing for a folkier version. Folkier or more, um, you know, just blues, you know, rock, you know, something, okay. you know, along those lines. And I refused to do that. And um, and we had a little standoff. So they didn't cut me from the label, but they kind of just blocked me from recording for other people. So. That's one of the reasons I had to leave the country, but it's a dark period that I'll... Right. It's, I mean, I'm past that. That was, sure. that was a long time ago, so I don't want to take up too much It's a fascinating moment, though. Time. So we, we move to Europe now, where I'd like to know about how your initial reception was there, but... Oh, yeah, that when, that, when that record did come out, it was the first blues record with a parental advisory stick on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm real, I'm real proud of that. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so you trying to trying to be true to soccer blue, you know? Yeah. Well, that and that is, I mean, that's why I, f I feel like your take on the blues works so well with your career. It, a, a secular rebelliousness that I I dig and I I dig it with you, you know. Uh, so Europe had a very different reaction. Uh, over there, you made 21st century blues and my pain, your pleasure, which. I get the feeling that it changed the idea of authenticity, where these were very considered very authentic records over there. Do you feel like that, that was their reception? Did you do something weird on purpose? <laughs> or was that, was, did the audience change, or did you feel like you just found a better way to present that music? Well, Certainly the audience, audience changed because the European audience is, is very different, you know. I mean, in America you have, you basically had black radio and white radio. Mm. And, um, and if you fall in between those things, you, you don't get any radio play. So, you know, the kind of music I was playing, I mean, playing guitar is not going to get you a lot of radio play on black radio stations. But then playing guitar you know, white radio stations are not going to play a black man in America playing a guitar. Right. And um, so there's no black radio, white radio in Europe. It's just radio. Right. And they'll play you whether you sing Italian, 
whether you sing German, whether you sing French, language or whether you is sing not a English. Either. Yeah, language uh, isn't a barrier, you know, it's so you get out of those, you know, Jim Crow definitions of music and things that are so ridiculous. And one day, you know, hopefully we'll get past it. But um yeah. so but what, what was interesting and what, what is part of kind of uh, makes sense in our discussion right now is that France was the, was, the, was the place that really embraced my music and, and you know, I made, they put me on like the front page of, the, of their newspaper, you know, when I came over there to, to perform and they started putting me in their the finest theaters to perform and things like this yes. and on the television shows and so out of France, out of Paris, you know, then the rest of Europe kind of said, hey, we want to see what this is all about. Right. And I began to get invited, you know, to play in England and other places. And I ended up living in England for a while. And then later I ended up moving to Copenhagen and I was there for a few years. But, um, but then, but I didn't know it at the time, but, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't conscious of what I, you know, about blues being, you know, Creole and all that. Right. But it makes sense that France would get me, you know? Right, they, I mean, do have, they have a history of appreciating well, Af African-American things that we don't. I mean, well, is that... Well, uh, that's true, but, but, uh, but French in Louisiana, you know, France and Louisiana, Paris and New Orleans, there's, oh. there's, 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 there's a connection there right. when it comes to culture. Right, right. And when it comes to, you know, they're not caught up in all this Puritan, you know, right. stuff and blue laws about this and uptight about that. And, right. You know, so there's there's a cultural connection there that I I can't. The secular news, the secular looseness maybe well, was finding its home. Yeah, because old Louisiana was was very French, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so it makes sense that they got it, you know, yeah. or they understood what I was putting putting out there and found it more interesting than people who were trying to pretend they were from. Uh, you know that they were sharecropping on some Mississippi plantation because right. a lot of that is is. That's the other annoying thing that people always say that the blues is dying, but what's dying is this, is that culture that we used to have, you know? And uh, that culture should be dying. I mean, why are we raising money to keep that going? I mean, that don't make any sense. Seems a little way overdue. Yeah, and then it's false anyway. It's right. not even, it don't have anything to do with the, with, with the origins of blues. Blues is not gonna stop because people aren't picking cotton anymore. It don't have nothing to do with picking cotton. Or suffering, like somehow the idea don't that have anything to do the blues with is going to stop if people stop suffering. <laughs> the only person that's suffering is and, is, and, and depressed is the guy at the end of the bar at, at 2 o'clock who ain't got nobody to go home with. <laughs> you know, he's crying in his, crying in his beer, you know. Right. <laughs> so he, that sad song might work for him, but... That guy needs music too. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's... That, you know, but that's the idea of what blues is. But then that definition is only applied to African American musicians. Right. You know, it's not applied to white musicians. White musicians, don't nobody ever sit down them in an interview and say, did, you, did your grandpa pick any cotton back on what plantation was he from? Right. You know, they don't ask them that. Right, 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 right. You know, so, but they get to come and play the festival just like everybody else. Right. So why black musicians are put into, that, into this thing? And it's false. If it was the truth, then you know, let the chips fall where they may. That's right. But when it's when it's when it's when it's fake, it, then it's like uh, you know, hey man, what's what's going on here? Because a lot of people don't realize that the Mississippi Delta is is kind of only a, a hundred years old or so. It don't go back to slave. No, there were no slaves in the Mississippi Delta. Right. There were no cotton plantations in the Mississippi Delta. People didn't live in the Mississippi Delta. Because it flooded. No. It was a delta. It was, it was a forest. It was, <laughs> it was a forest. It right. were black bears and, and right, wild right. panthers running around the delta. <laughs> they didn't clear the delta, man, until like the 1890s or the turn of the 20th century. So there was no human beings that even right. sing the blues. Right, right, right. It was, it was just wilderness. It's crazy that you have to give a me a geography lesson to I mean, redefine the blues, though. I mean, that's how ingrained that definition is for us. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, that's where he used to go hunting black bear. And, you know, 1905 or something, he used to hang out there and go hunting bear. I mean, because, you know, I think they have a forest named Teddy Roosevelt over there. 
But there were no human beings in, the, in Cleveland, Mississippi. There's, you can check the census. In 1910, probably maybe 700 people lived in all of the Delta. Right, right, right. So people migrated up there, you know, uh, that's, that's 20th century stuff. It has nothing to do with slavery. All the slave plantations was along the Mississippi, uh, on the river, on the river banks where they could load the docks and things like that. You couldn't, they ain't had no roads, anything to get your, your crop from the middle of the delta to the river. How right. you gonna even get it there? No, no, everything had to be right next to the Yeah, well, and then you would have gotten eaten by the bears and the, and the wild <laughs> panthers anyway. So, I mean, right. there no, was- No, man, I, I cannot, I mean, I'd be a damn fool to argue with Chris Thomas King. <laughs> no, so from Vicksburg to Memphis, there was, there was, not, there was a safari. Right. But at that time, in New Orleans and in Louisiana, you know, you had musicians coming up to Plaquemine on train excursions and playing all around New Orleans. I mean, the blues was alive and well in Lincoln Park in New Orleans. Right. At when, when people were just starting to clear the land it, in right, the Delta. Right, extend into the Delta. Yeah. Oh, man. So, I mean, I'm just saying the whole idea is just ridiculous. And, I, you know. I know, but I, I yeah, absolutely. I dig, I dig the way you talk about this, though. This is, you know, this is not the version well, the of the Dockery story that we are the, told. I've been to the Dockery Plantation a few times. It's a nice family. You know, they, they um, you know, are good patrons to the music and stuff. But you have to kind of, if you're going to get their money, you kind of have to go along with the program. The narrative that has been... Yeah. Right, I did. But the Dockery, the guy didn't even buy the Dockery until 1995. I mean, 18, 1895. That's when he oh, bought the land. Right. And then it took a few years to clear the land. Right. So, but in, but I mean, Jelly Roll Martin and people like that were, were the blues was already swinging all over New Orleans, right. you know, in 1895. And that's documented. There's no photographs. No, and nobody argues with that. I mean, just an interesting incongruity. If anybody got a photograph of anybody in the Delta, a human being. <laughs> In the Delta, but in, in the early, early, very early 1900s, it turned, there's no photographs of people. Right. Where would they have sung the blues if they were singing it? There were no theaters, there were no clubs, there were no bars, there were no, where are you going to sing it? In a tree? I mean, in, in the swamp? Well, on a porch, but there wasn't even There wasn't porches. even a porch. Right, 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 right. right. I mean, I, I've searched for these photographs and there's, there's nothing exists. The, the, where, what was the newspaper in the Delta at the time? There, was there a newspaper? I don't think bears, you know. Bears don't read the newspaper. Yeah, so. That is a heck of a point. I couldn't find anything. That might be the quote of this in, in interview. Now, bears somebody, don't might, read somebody might come up and discover something that I don't know about. You know, I'm always open. I'm sure. not closed-minded. But I, I don't, nobody has come up with anything. It's just a bunch of conjecture. Right. And people go with this word, this Anglo word, blues, and they think sad, depressed, melancholy. So it has something to do with work songs, it has something to do with slavery and, and being down in, in the dumps. And it's just people connecting dots that, that are not there. I find this very refreshing. Yeah. I dig it, I really do. Now you're gonna get me in trouble because I'm gonna start an argument. I'm gonna be like, no, but Chris Thomas King, you don't understand. Uh, and I don't think they're gonna take my word for it. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so I mean, you guys kind of know, I guess I'm, I'm pretty plain spoken. You guys know where I stand on this thing. But my music, it flows a little bit different. I've done more with my movies and different things I've done to promote Mississippi over the years than I have Louisiana. Right. You know, um, and so I don't begrudge uh, Mississippi at all. But I will say this, you know, to people who organize the blues and patrons and people who support it, they shouldn't have Louisiana blues musicians playing second fiddle to musicians from Chicago or Mississippi and places. Because when we travel to Japan to do a festival, it's like, oh, you're not from Mississippi, so you know, you're not the headliner or you're not the authentic one. You're just kind of, can you do us another song by Muddy Waters? Can right. you do another song by Robert Johnson? So you're saying that the false narrative is it hurts still, us. It's still actually it perpetuating hurt, real it, hurt, it hurts me. Problems. It hurts me as a Louisiana uh, blues musician uh, for Louisiana to tell the world that I'm, uh, I'm, 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 not, I'm not Batman, I'm Robin. You right, know? right, right. I'm the sidekick. 
Right. And that hurts me. It hurts, it hurts our culture. And then it's just not true. So I'd like to have Louisiana, you know, uh, the reason I'm outspoken about it is because sometimes when I play on the guitar, I write a song, everybody don't speak guitar, you know? Yeah. So sometimes people don't get it when you do some abstract art. Sometimes you just have to just say it, you know? It's like Mississippi origins is a lie. The blues originated in Creole culture in Louisiana. And Louisiana musicians, at least the ones who are still being true to what Louisiana musical thing is about, is, um, is, is trying to keep this music alive. So the, quick, the, the sooner we can kill this Mississippi thing and put it to rest, and get on with the business of promoting our culture, yeah. you know, where we, we birthed this to the world, and we don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't tell people that. And then we like to hide behind this word jazz, which is a stupid word. It's a stupid word. It has no relevance, no meaning. Right. I've never met a jazz musician that liked this word. Right, it's right, a, right, right. It's which a stupid is why none word. of them like to define it. We're all blues musicians. Ah. I like uh, that. Jazz I, is, we need to stop talking about we're, from, we're the home of jazz. You know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And it's insulting. Man. That we should, we're the home of the blues. Right. But not the Anglo blues. We're the home of the Creole blues. We created that. And I, I share this, this, this other thing, and the audience might have a question or two, but... Yeah. When I talk about this Creole thing, you got to understand that before the Americans came to Louisiana, we had a, a culture that was unique, you know, under Spanish rule, but with a very French, um, we kept the French language and kept the French way of, of, of looking culture at Culture and customs. Yeah, culture. But it was Spanish rule. And uh, you had a lot of free people, um, it wasn't, a, it wasn't, they weren't free people of color, they were just free people. There was a lot of black people in Louisiana who had never been slaves, their parents hadn't been slaves, they don't even know what, they had came over as conquistadors that came over to America in a lot of other ways. Some of, some of them did come as slaves, but then they could buy their way out of that through manumission and things like this. But when the Americans came down to Louisiana and they saw, we're talking, after the Louisiana Purchase, and the Americans started coming. And, the, and, and, and we decided that we weren't gonna just let them change our culture. Mm -hmm. You know, we, have, we ball every day. I mean, somebody might visit New Orleans or visit Louisiana and say, hey man, there's, what's this festival called that's going on? It was, it was a Tuesday and it has a festival. I say, the festival is just called Tuesday, yeah. you know? <laughs> We just have a festival for anything. Right. We right. used to have, they used to call them balls. You know, we used to have balls and they were a little more formal. Mm -hmm. But now there's a festival, like three and four festivals every day of, of, of anything. You can't even run out of things to call them. Right. But that, though we, that's our culture. Right. We don't even, even when people die at a funeral, we have a good time. We celebrate. We're not, Ball. we're not dancing on their graves because we're happy they're dead. <laughs> You know, that's our way of celebrating them. So um, the Puritan people came down here, Americans, and they started trying to tell people they can't dance on Sundays. It's forbidden. You know, it's, it's, they created blue laws. Right. And they said, you can't drink alcohol. You know, we, you're drinking alcohol. This is on a Sunday. You, you, you're not supposed to do that. And, and then these mixed race people or people of different skin colors are dancing and making families with each other. Right. And this is against the law, you can't do that. Right, it's like, in, that well, self, in itself that was a rebellion. It's like, well, okay, I'm mixed race, what am I supposed to do with myself, you know? Right. I mean, which, which door do I go in? So we had all these things happening and Louisiana pushed back against that and said, no, we're gonna maintain our culture. And we're gonna, you might call it blue laws and that we can't dance on Sunday, but you know, we're gonna celebrate, we're gonna wear it as a badge of honor, you know? And so our, there was this dance that went on for 100 years with the Americans. And the Americans won at Plessy versus Ferguson. That ruling in 18, what well, it was, early 1890s or something. Okay. And yeah. that was the final straw. 
where, you know, being Creole uh, or whatever, you know, it's like either you're black or white, and if you're black, you get on the back of the bus, you can't do this and you can't do that. And, right. And that was kind of the death knell or that treaty that, uh, that existential treaty that the Creoles had with the Americans that y'all gonna allow us to do what we do. But, you know, um, you know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll make some changes or whatever, but you're still going to allow us to, to do, you know, our, to keep our culture going. But when they did that, that's when the blues really began, you know, yeah. because they would, you, you would take the marching band music, which is very rigid. You know, you're marching in a parade or something, Sosa, and it's like, you know, uh, I, I'm thinking of trying to think of something in my head, but. Well, no, but it's it's a very four four. All this kind of. I always called it oompa music, but it's very German. Yeah, but it's very rigid. Yeah, you know, and you can't be out of step, and the notes have to be precise on the beat and all this stuff here. But the Louisiana musicians say, "No, we're gonna do it our way, and we're gonna boom, 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 boom. We're gonna do it like that." Yes. And the Puritans come and they say, "Well." We want you to sing when the saints go marching in. We, you know, a nice, quiet, gen genteel song. You know, very calm and right. <laughs> and the New Orleans people say we gonna take you. We gonna tell you what we think of your religion. You know, right? You don't respect our voodoo. You don't respect our religion. Well, you know, we gonna. And you it see, is an, but th this is this is this is what you were saying when we started. Is an act of rebellion, an act of counterculture. It's, it's, in it's, it's, it's the 1890s. It's Louisiana saying, we're going to do us. Yeah. You know, and, you know, damn your blue laws, you know. Yeah. We're going to do us. And what's wrong with dancing? What's wrong <laughs> with people dancing? Why is that? Out Why are they outraged? Right. Why are they outraged when people of different races are dancing with each other? What, what is so, I mean, bombing people, now that's something to be outraged about. But dancing? I mean, what, what the hell are we talking about here? Right. Why is this the devil's music? Because it brings people together. Because it, you know, so that whole dance, all these institutions, you know, that the, Amer the Americanization of Louisiana, the Creoles pushed back on that. And yeah. that's how the blues came into being. And that's what the blues is. And the blues has no shame in, in its culture. There's no shame in it. There's nothing wrong with it. No, no, but I, 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 I love and appreciate you talking to me in this depth, <laughs> diving into the deep end with me. All right, I want to give everybody a, uh, I want to give, we have a little time left. I want to give them an opportunity to ask a question, but I also, I have one last question just to bring us up to date. Where do you feel the, 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 what do you feel the role of the blues or what would you like to see the role of the blues today as it could be a continued vehicle for social rebellion? I'm sorry, what was the last ah, So as it could be, I, I, I don't want to get too political. Like, I see an opportunity in today's climate for blues to do what you have described its very origins to be. Where would you like to see the blues go knowing the way we have now redefined it? Thank you to your history. Well, that's a difficult question for me to answer because I can't speak for everybody. And I'm not a spokesman for any group of people. I'm hardly a spokesman for the blues because Everybody else you talk to is gonna say, "Man, don't pay any attention to Chris Thomas King. He's crazy." I love it. So, you know, I can only speak for myself, and um, and I can only speak for my legacy that I'm trying to leave behind. And that part of that is that I have a book that I've been working on for a while, and this book is the working title is "The Authentic Narrative of My Music and Culture Therewith." Yeah. And so I'm gonna to try to the things that I'm expressing to everyone today. I'm you know, I go into depth in the book, and um, and hopefully that book um, can have a release, you know, pretty soon. But you know, what I just like the public to know, and especially the patrons of this music, I'd like them to be better informed, you know, yeah. So that so that so that their money is not that they put into putting on a festival that they, you know, understand what the festival 
is so that they can program it better and so that it can have some lasting uh, pass down. But, you know, we're not here uh, celebrating Mississippi Delta and sharecropping right. or, or tenant farming. And that's just don't have, that, that don't make any sense. And that, so the, 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 the proper narrative, the, the blues need to reconnect with its original uh, defiant uh, creolization, fighting against Americanization. You know, it needs to kind of reconnect with, with, with its origins. Yes. Its pure origins. And, and, and we need to celebrate that because we look at, the, we look at what we've won. I mean, back then, um, I think there was prohibition, you know, on drinking and things. And Went people, through that stage. A woman couldn't go into a bar and have a drink. Went through that stage. You had, like, uh, you know, some of the early musicians, like Tony Jackson, you know, was gay. But people were okay with that, you know. Right. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of uh, tolerance and things and a lot of uh, enlightenment you know, that this music originally had and still have. But what happens is that, that all those good things kind of get co-opted and get taken away. Uh, and then they try to give the black musicians and say, y'all stay in this little area and do this little thing. And we got to talk about picking cotton. <laughs> and that don't have any, it's like, I, that's fine if we want to talk about that, but it don't have anything to do with, with this music. But then Mick Jagger just won the, the Rolling Stones just won uh, album of the year at the Grammys. Best blues album. Best they won best right. best traditional blues album at that. <laughs> Competing with people like Henry Gray, right. and Lazy Lester, and, right. and, and people. Right. And it's like now, how much cotton did Mick Jagger pick to win that Grammy? I want to know. Zero pounds. Keith Richards. I mean, did they fly in on their private? They yeah. probably each flew in on their own private, own private jet, jet with their chef and everybody right. else to come pick up their award. I mean, and it, that's fine. They get to play too, but but that's how you know, right? It's bullshit. Right. That's how you know. That's how because they they sound just like they sounded in 1963. It sounds like they could be the first album. That's right. Yeah. So what's different? It's just that rock and roll is dead. Don't nobody really, you know. Move, are, are not people are not moved by that music, and so now they come moving in on the blues, and they start booking these bands at the festivals. Right. And it's like, don't go to Washington D.C. and go to the taxpayers and get money to do this African American festival, and use my photograph and use Henry Gray photograph, and then when you get the money, then you go give it to all the rock bands. Right. I mean, you know, give me the money. Yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> Will you? I mean, you used me to get it. <laughs> That's right. Oh, man. So the money got to go back into, you know, it's got to it benefit blues artists. And then it's got to benefit the community that, that, that it comes from. Right. And so what happens is you have people who are, they want to do the right thing. They want to give back. They want to, to, they move by this music. But they seem to be in darkness about about it. The, the narrative that has been told is not now helping the people it, it hurts that us, it originated. It hurts from. us more than not. And the fact that nobody seemed to be outraged that the Rolling Stones would even be nominated for a Grammy, let alone win one. Right. It just lets you know that this whole share, sharecropping thing in Mississippi is bullshit. Right. And, and rock and roll is, is a lie. Rock and roll is just white folks playing black music for white folks. That's, that's blues. Right. You know, just they can call it rock and roll, or they can call it electronic dance music. It's just hip hop, white guys, DJs at Coachella, <laughs> playing for a whole <laughs> bunch of white kids at Coachella. And it's just a hip hop show. Let's just call it what it is. But ain't no black people in the audience, ain't no black people on stage, except right. a, a special guest will come in, <laughs> and he'll rap one song with his pants hanging in, and he's singing on the stage. And it's all fun and cool, but that's just, that's just, that's just hip hop. That's just black culture by another name. Right. And then, and, and, you know, it's like we're going to design a, a, this fictitious genre, swing, jazz, whatever the hell they decide to call there, it. There are a dozen it names. Matter, it doesn't even matter what the name is. The, right. the design of it is that white folks love this black music. And we're going to figure out how to make sure that black people don't get paid <laughs> and that only white folks come to the show. 
And, and that's the gig. That's that's that's. And the Rolling Stones winning a, a a Grammy just tells me that all that rock and roll stuff was just. We already knew that as blues musicians that right. it was a lie. But it's so blatant and in your face when they come back. It's really solidifying your theory. Yeah. Now, if they were nominating me for heavy metal <laughs> Grammys. <laughs> then I, I wouldn't have no problem with it. All right, tit for tat. Stone, if the Rolling Stones come and take the blues, and him and Keith Richards right. come and take the blues category from us, where, where do we go? No, I don't know. Chris, sir, you have been more than generous with your time. We, we are out of time. I've got to wrap it up. But everybody, please. Let's get, let's get at least one or two questions from the yeah? audience. I All think right. that's only fair. Uh, does anybody have a question? Please speak up. I would say that learn all that you can about art, uh, whatever art, being an actress is an artist, you know. So learn all that you can about what you, um, learn, learn the history of it so that you know, um, you'll be able to tell a, a great painting or a great dance routine or a great play or opera or something from something that's just a rip off of something earlier because I think you have to, I think if you really want to be successful, you have to have something unique about yourself that you can present to the world. And, and that'll give you longevity, I think. So be your, you know, find out who you are, what you, what you want to express, and be true to that. One, one more question before well, I go, if anybody Does anybody have one, have one more? I'm not. Oh, the little bit. <laughs> yes, sir. I think I pretty much said everything, and I'm so free in my expression, you know, that most people are probably intimidated now to ask me anything. No, but don't it, be intimidated by by anything that I have said up here. You know, uh, when I talk about white and black, it's just to uh, get through all the language barriers that we have. We talk about jazz and swing and rock and roll, and we're gonna talk about. We're just talking about the blues. We're just talking about that culture. And it goes by a lot of different names. Just like I was born, I think when I was born, I was colored. And then I was called something else, African-American. Then I'm black. And then I'm Negro. And I think that was on my birth certificate. So I'm just the same person. But you have all these different names, you know. And sometimes a name be one of the reasons that the blues became, they had to change the name of the blues in the early 20s to jazz or to something else, or swing, is because the word blues became a pejorative. When our culture left Louisiana and went to, to New York and Harlem and places like that, people don't, they still don't understand, our, <laughs> it's complicated, they don't understand our, our culture. So the words get lost in translation and everybody who is singing or doing comedy that is blue comic comedy, like like Richard Pryor, that's a blue comic, you know, everybody who use curse words or do, you know, dirty dancing or something, that is not necessarily art, you know. But there was a a, a reason that people defied uh, did the did a, a Christian song like when the saints go marching in in the way that they did it. And then the, the Christians said that that was blasphemous for us to be singing when the saints go marching in and people drinking liquor and women are showing their breasts and they say that that's the devil's music. But it's not the devil's music. And that's our culture, you know. That's how we express ourselves. And women's breasts being exposed, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's how people dress when we got to America when, when it was supposedly discovered. And if we can get back to the place where women can walk around without a shirt, just like men on a beach, and nobody is gonna harm her, we'll be more enlightened and, and better human beings. So, you know, I'm proud of our culture, and I think, our, I think the blues has an enlightening quality to it, and a, 
and it says that it's nothing wrong with sensuality. There's nothing wrong with a lot of the things that we do because we're humans, you know? Yeah. We have emotions and things. And so to me, blues is, is an enlightened music and it, 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 it gets to me when it's covered up by, that beauty is covered up by so much, I don't know how else to say it, but just so much darkness. Yeah. So that, that's, that's my rap. Y'all. I dropped a mic. Everybody, please, Chris Thomas King. Thank y'all very much for coming out. Stay tuned. <laughs>